welcome everybody to uh, I think one of the last sessions for this uh, year. I will. I think there's three weeks left or something like this. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Sven Hermann here from the uh, Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity, CARM. That is a German acronym, Center. Well, it actually says it here also in, uh, well, probably just Centrum, Centrum <laughs> and Angewandt. Um, yes, uh, sorry. Sven Hermann uh, works at SAM for already uh, more than 10 years. Uh, before, he uh, did um, his PhD in the group of Achim Peters in Berlin, where he uh, also met, uh, as we learned before. Uh, hey, I'm blanking. What's his name again? Holger, Holger Müller. Müller. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. No, he's not Jesus. He's Holger Müller. <laughs> he met Jesus and Holger Müller at the same time and followed them to uh, Stanford in the US where he worked uh, in the group of uh, Professor Stephen Chu. Uh, yeah, since 2009, he is however in, in, in Bremen and is going to tell us a bit about uh, measurement of gravitational redshift with Galileo satellites. So thanks a lot for coming. Looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you Arne for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak here and um, you are listening. So. Um, this talk will be about a measurement of the gravitational redshift with Galileo satellites, and I put in the title that we did by accident, yeah, and maybe you already know a bit about the story. Yeah? It was really an accident. So my usual topic is, as we just discussed, more related to atom interferometry and quantum gases, and this is uh, coming from a different direction. But I, I hope it's a more or less interesting story. And so the idea was that I tell you a little bit, a bit more about the background, what, what happened, uh, how this evolved and how we did the analysis and, and so on. So here is uh, the story. It all started in 2014 when the first, uh, or when the Galileo satellites number five and six were launched with a Russian Soyuz rocket here, you can see it. Uh, these are labeled number five and six. Um, there were four satellites before that. They were the so-called in-orbit validation satellites. So these number five and six satellites were actually the first uh, satellites that were supposed to have full operational capability in this European uh, GNSS system, Galileo. So everyone was very excited about that, of course. And then a nightmare to the engineers, to the space engineers and to the Galileo program happened because there was this accident. Um, from what I know and what I learned so far is what happened actually is that uh, at the, when these two satellites were supposed to be dispatched, injected into the orbit, which is shown here in an illustration uh, by the uh, upper stage uh, Fregat module, yeah, uh, there was a fuel line in the attitude control system. Uh, the fuel is hydrazine here, and that was actually frozen unnoticed to, to the engineers and to the control uh, systems. So that means this uh, upper stage didn't really get the right attitude and injected these two satellites into the wrong orbit. Yeah? Uh, the reason they figured out later on is uh, that there was uh, an aluminum clamp in a position where it formed a thermal bridge somehow and that led to this accident. So this is what they figured out uh, retrospectively. Anyways. What is the spatial scale here? What, how big are these? Ah, I have a drawing uh, later on where you can see it in relation to, uh, uh, to a person. So I, I have to, uh, two two meters something it's it's in the in the drawing in a in a couple of slides but is it like uh, i mean can they be pretty happy that that didn't explode i mean this kind of uh, mistake uh, no just... no no I, I i don't think there was any danger of them being exploded i think there was just not the right amount of thrust for a certain amount of time because there was no fuel uh, uh, injected somewhere to the attitude control and then this whole thing was in the wrong position and and uh, that's for all I know, uh, what, what happened, basically. So, uh, yeah, this is what the situation then looked like uh, initially. So the they went into, for us, luckily, an eccentric orbit initially at an eccentricity of 0.23 uh, with a pretty low perigee. Um, so the nominal uh, orbit uh, uh, radius should have been something like 29,000 kilometers. And now this perigee was at uh, 20,000 kilometers. And the first problem that they encountered was that this was so low that uh, the Earth sensors couldn't really get a full view 
of the Earth. This is indicated with this green uh, shadow here. Yeah? So they pretty uh, early on uh, had to uh, quickly decide that they have to lift the perigee at least even to get a full view of Earth and to get uh, the Earth sensors operating and then with that to establish the right attitude and the right pointing of the antennas to, to have everything operational. So that's what they did. They spent a lot of the fuel that was actually meant for maneuvering uh, and for maintenance and everything in the in, in, in during the lifetime of the mission. Uh, to do that, the fuel was not enough to recover the original orbit, of course, but it was enough to raise the perigee up to 23,500 kilometers. And with that, reduce the eccentricity to 0.16. Now, when we learned about this, uh, Klaus Lemmertsal learned about this, uh, Hans-Jörg Dittus uh, also um, uh, heard about this. We were actually very, very excited. Yeah, Maybe in the beginning, we were the only ones who were, were excited about this because uh, this situation where you have an eccentric orbit and you have a satellite in an eccentric orbit with an, a reasonably good atomic clock on board is uh, what we had suggested to space agencies in the past already uh, to do such a mission specifically to test the gravitational redshift. So when we heard this, uh, we were very happy and said, oh, that's cool. That's what we have been actually uh, looking for and waiting for. We were a bit worried in the beginning because we thought, okay, maybe uh, they will declare these satellites lost and they will kind of stop operation with them and, and shut them down. So. Uh, Klaus Lemmertsal and Hans-Jörg Dittus and Fritz Merkel also, they were very active to reach out to people at uh, ESA and DLR and tell them, please, please, please don't uh, stop these satellites, uh, keep them operating. Yeah. I think there was no real danger that they would switch them down, but we as scientists in the beginning thought maybe, maybe they will uh, take strange decisions, but they were actually very happy that we reached out to them because uh, for them it was a, a good way to make something good come out of something bad. Okay, uh, yeah, so as I said, yeah, we, we thought it's a really good opportunity to test uh, relativity and maybe Einstein would also have uh, enjoyed or, or, or been happy about this. Okay, so. Clearly not happy. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so in the, in the following three years or so, we worked a little bit on this and we managed to uh, get something out of it, which we published here in uh, PRL. And uh, the story behind this is what uh, will be the topic of this, of most of this talk, let's say, yeah. And here is the outline. So I will start with a little historic uh, introduction to uh, talk about what tests of the redshift has been done. Then I have to introduce a little bit of GNSS background. So this is sort of the, the route and that we also took when we started on this. I had not much idea about uh, how GNSS, uh, about the world of GNSS, yeah, how these people uh, look at the things. And I had to learn a lot uh, uh, there actually. So I will repeat a little bit of that. And then we can look at how we analyze the data. And then I want in the end to talk a little bit about what other tests of the redshift and also quantum tests of the redshift are currently discussed. Okay, so I look back in history. So the, the test of the gravitational redshift was actually among the three tests uh, that Einstein proposed himself to test his new theory of a general relativity that he brought forward in 1915. Yeah? So he, he made the suggestion to do this uh, light deflection experiment that was quickly then done by Eddington. He also made the suggestion to, yeah, to or, or he actually did uh, the calculation for the perihelion shift of Mercury. And he also suggested to look for this uh, gravitational redshift. And uh, this was targeted, for example, here in, in, in Potsdam, where maybe you have been to Potsdam to uh, the Telegrafenberg, and you have seen this uh, nice building here. This is the Einstein Tower. And on top of this tower, there is a solar observatory that was put there initially in the 20s with, among other things, uh, the purpose of doing such a measurement, measuring the shift of the uh, Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum due to the gravitational uh, effects here. And it turned out to be much more difficult and much more complicated than they had initially thought. So it took, I think, until the 60s, until they could really uh, do this measurement in the 70s. So this uh, did not work initially. But it, so the first test of this gravitational redshift, you may have heard about this too, was then kind of surprisingly uh, coming from a very different experimental uh, side. And that was done by Pound and Repka and later by Pound and Snyder, who uh, were able to, uh, detect this effect in a pair of uh, mass power emitter and absorbers with gamma radiation. Yeah, they were making use of this newly discovered, then newly discovered mass power effect with extremely narrow resonances. And so they 
have only uh, had to employ a height difference of about 23 meters here in uh, the Jefferson Tower building in Harvard. And then they put their emitters on, I think, loudspeakers and modulated the, the, the Doppler effect. And with that, they have been able to see this uh, effect and detect it at, at relatively moderate precision. And then a couple of years later in the 70s, um, maybe also uh, you have heard about this at some point, uh, there was the famous gravity probe A experiment where they did a dedicated mission, a dedicated uh, experiment where they put a hydrogen maser onto a sounding rocket. A sounding rocket is a rocket that does not go the orbit. It just goes on a ballistic trajectory up to a certain altitude, in this case, 10,000 kilometers. And during the flight, they did a direct comparison to a maser on the ground. Yeah. So in a two-way frequency link, in this two-way frequency link, they could do a differential measurement to compensate for the linear, for the uh, normal Doppler effect. And they did this very efficiently and they um, managed to uh, uh, do a measurement of the predicted frequency shift, which is a combination of the relativistic quadratic Doppler effect and the uh, 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 gravitational uh, uh, redshift at an uncertainty on the order of seven times 10 to the minus five. Yeah, that's the, for, for the complete um, uh, frequency shift here. Here you can see from uh, one of the papers that they published, uh, the flight took about two hours and um, the modulation of the gravitational potential that they saw was on the order of uh, four times 10 to the minus 10. And uh, back then you can also see here uh, they took really a direct uh, measure here of the beat note of the two masers here on strip charts. Yeah. So you can see how the beat frequency uh, on, on, on ground is actually uh, at a finite value, and then it goes through zero uh, to the apogee and back again. So they did, really did a direct comparison of these two clocks here in that sense. Okay. Um, the theoretical framework to really parameterize these uh, uh, tests of the redshift uh, are nicely summarized and described in this uh, Living Uru article by Clifford Will, which uh, uh, I can recommend. And I took this graph from there. This go shows you the, uh, the, the history, let's say, and the accuracies that have been achieved uh, throughout the, uh, the decades on this test. Yeah. And, uh, Gravity Probe A mission here was uh, up to then the best um, absolute test of this uh, gravitational redshift. Yeah, and it's the gravita gravitational redshift maybe um, uh, is simply uh, the frequency change here uh, given by the change in the gravitational potential uh, over C squared. Yeah. And then to parameterize uh, deviation from relativity, you introduce a test parameter alpha. and if relativity, if the relativistic prediction is fully correct, then alpha is zero. And you just have this simple uh, general relativistic prediction of the redshift. And if you measure a deviation, then you have a non-zero alpha value here. And the result of this uh, GPA experiment on this test parameter, if you uh, use this formalism, is that it's on the level of 1.4 times 10 to minus four. And why should it be interesting to test the gravitational redshift at all? Well, it's a part of the so-called Einstein equivalence principle yeah? together with the universality of free fall. Uh, the universal validity of this uh, uh, redshift also for different clocks, you can also de do differential measurements with different clocks that are going through the gravitational potentials uh, together and you make a differential measurement with that you can even get uh, more and better accuracies, which is shown by the red arrows here. This universality of the gravitational redshift is another very important ingredient of this uh, Einstein equivalence principle from which then uh, the, the theory of general relativity actually uh, well, it de uh, derives or falls in place, let's say. Um, do we expect a, a certain deviation or a, a violation of this uh, effect? Do we expect that uh, this alpha will be non-zero at a certain level? I have to say, um, I don't know of a specific theory that would predict this at a certain level. Uh, but of course, uh, if you ask theorists, um, the general um, um, understanding, I think, of everyone is that we have to test this as good as possible. And 
if we are looking for modi or for unifications with of general relativity with quantum field theories then at some point we might expect some deviations but i can't really tell at which level that would be so it's generally driven by just the general motivation to do the tests as accurate and as precise as possible okay now uh, 40 years almost uh, after this GPA experiment, we have now this situation with these uh, two Galileo satellites in this eccentric orbit. And initially we thought, oh, that's great. We have something like two GPA experiments every day yeah? because uh, the satellites go around uh, the Earth approximately two times per day. And they go up and down between perigee and apogee by 8,500 kilometers. Yeah? So that's a very nice thing. But if you look a bit closer, it's not that easy. Uh, most importantly, for example, you are high up in the altitude here, uh, 20, 30,000 kilometers. So the gravitational potential modulation that the two satellites see is actually about 10, uh, 10 times less than the modulation that uh, you had during the GPA mission, where you start from ground. Then in this case, the mission, of course, was never designed to uh, to do such a test. Yeah, it was never uh, designed. Uh, there was no way to establish a direct clock comparison of these clocks on board with a clock on ground, as it was done in the Gravity Probe A mission. And then, of course, you have to take care of all the issues with the clock stabilities, with the systematic effects, and all these things. And that's not very easy if this mission has never been designed for specifically the purpose of testing uh, uh, relativity. So there are a lot of uh, constraints. Okay. Now uh, here, yeah, this uh, maybe uh, answers a bit the question uh, how large and how big uh, these uh, satellites are. So a few words now on, on, on these satellites. Uh, here you can see uh, actually the two satellites uh, in the upper stage of the Cyrus uh, rocket on the Fregat module. And here you can see, see a sketch of uh, what's inside and how these um, uh, satellites look like. Uh, they weigh about 700 kilograms. Uh, here are the dimensions, 2.5 meters, uh, three meters roughly with the, with, the, uh, with the being stowed. And here is the comparison to, to a human here. Uh, the interesting part, of course, for us are the clocks. This is the clock segment, and I will come to that in a second. Here I have listed a little bit of the uh, labeling. Uh, we were quite confused in the beginning uh, what, what are the terms that they are using. Yeah? So these two satellites that we always refer to as number five and number six in the series are officially uh, Galileo Sat 0201 and 0202. And in the actual data that you are looking for, uh, the clock data, you will always find this satellite vehicle identification number and that's E18 and E14. So when I show some data in the following uh, slides, uh, it's often labeled with E18 and E14, which refers to these two satellites. Okay, yeah, here's an image of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, uh, how this looked during the assembly. And you can see the passive, two passive hydrogen masers back here and two rubidium uh, frequency, atom atomic frequency standards uh, in front here. Yeah. So the primary clocks are the passive hydrogen masers, the rubidium atomic frequency stand standards are sort of backup clocks. And then they are all with model A and model B for redundancy. Uh, this, I think, was taken, if I'm not mistaken, at OHB, uh, which uh, happens to be uh, less than a kilometer away from our institute. So it's basically almost across the street, yeah. uh, which unfortunately doesn't mean that we can just go over there and ask them about all the details and all the specifications that we were interested in. Unfortunately, with ESA and uh, you and everything it, it's, and, and the Galileo program, it doesn't work that easily, yeah, which we also had to learn. Yeah. So uh, yeah, here's the, the hydrogen maser clock uh, specified for uh, seven times 10 to the minus 15 frequency stability, uh, actively temperature stabilized to within these range. And we figured out a few of the specifications, it's temperature sensitivity and it's a mag magnetic field sensitivity uh, that they had established in uh, ground calibration uh, measurements. Uh, these uh, clocks um, uh, have been built by uh, by spectra time. By the way, um, could you comment on what this uh, flicker um, ah. floor? What does it mean? Yeah, ah, this flicker floor is it's shown here basically. Uh, this is a, a graph that we obtained early on when we asked them about how good are the clocks. They showed us this graph. Uh, so this graph is already a couple of years old, and maybe there are now uh, better uh, graphs. Uh, I didn't really 
uh, check that, I have to say, uh, but, but we check in our own data, of course. Um, this shows the Allen deviation for various clocks on various of the Galileo satellites. Uh, so the Allen deviation gives you the relative uh, 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 frequency variation on different integration time scales here. And the flicker flaw is actually when uh, measuring for longer times will not improve the, mm -hmm. the, the stability anymore here. Yeah. This is this flat uh, here. So uh, the, the clocks are supposed to level off, let's say, instability uh, in this flicker flaw around here. At, at, so, so this spec here is uh, at 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And on ground, they established that it's as low as 7 times 10 to the minus 15. And here, now this is produced from data that they took in flight. And there, the performance, of course, is a bit different. Uh, most importantly, you can see these bumps. And these bumps in the Allen deviation mean that there is actually something systematic going on. And the bump occur occurs at roughly 20,000 uh, seconds. And if you go to double the time, uh, that's roughly the orbital time scale. So you can see already from this, we could see, OK, there are systematic uh, variations going on. And that will not be so easy for us to, to analyze this. But one also has to say, uh, at least from my understanding, this is produced from rather indirectly obtained clock data. Yeah? So this is not a, a simple direct frequency comparison of uh, two clocks, but this is uh, derived from the clock products. And I will comment on that later what that means, yeah, and how these systematics can be reduced. Uh, just for completeness, I can also show uh, these uh, same graphs for the other clocks, the rubidium frequency standards, which, which are, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, quite worse than the passive hydrogen masers. So we were entirely focusing on the passive hydrogen maser clock data. OK, now the, the, the big question for us then was, OK, uh, can you give us the clock data? We, we want to access uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, frequency data of the, of the or time data of the clocks. And then uh, how does that work in this case? And to understand that, we have to look a little bit of at, at, at the working principles here of GNSS. Yeah? Uh, you all know that GNSS is based basically on ranging measurements. So you have the satellites, and you have uh, uh, ground stations or GPS receivers, and you essentially always measure the pseudo range. The pseudo range is uh, basically the travel time of your signals that you send from the satellite to the ground um, times the speed of light. And that uh, oops, means that the whole uh, data of the clocks is collected rather indirectly. So what they do in GNSS is exactly they, they collect all these pseudo range measurements or uh, also so called carrier phase measurements. And then uh, they, 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 they model and estimate the data. So the pseudo range is actually, is actually the, the real distance and then plus uh, the speed of light times an offset of your ground clock, which would give you an apparent uh, uh, change in the distance. And uh, also minus here uh, the speed of light times a, a satellite clock offset, yeah? uh, plus additional terms, delays in the instrument, uh, atmospheric delays, and so on. Yeah. So there is a lot of uh, stuff going in there uh, into into these uh, into these uh, estimations. And what they then do uh, to access the clock data of all these clocks is they take a lot a lot of these uh, measurements. Yeah, with many ground stations and many satellites. Let's say yeah. They set up these equations uh, with all these uh, with several unknowns and several model parameters, let's say. And then they estimate from, let's say, a number of n equations and a number of n uh, uh, unknowns, uh, they do estimates of these, uh, of these parameters. And what we are interested in is particularly, or what, what we are, what's, what's the, uh, the thing of interest for us is the offset or uh, of your satellite clock. Yeah? This is where the relativistic effects uh, will show up for us. Uh, you can do the same thing more sensitively with so-called carrier phase measurements. So I'm just showing this for completeness. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to look at all the, the things there, I guess. And as I said, there are now a number of ground stations worldwide which uh, collect this observation data to various of GNSS satellites, uh, GPS, uh, GNSS, uh, uh, and Galileo satellites and and and, and then this is all done in the so-called uh, international GNSS service. Yeah. 
This is a, 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 a collaboration, let's say, of about 200 uh, uh, partners, institutes, agencies who run these observation stations, who collect regularly this uh, pseudo range and carrier phase data. And uh, they do this not only for uh, Galileo, but also for uh, GPS, uh, GLONASS, and all the other uh, available uh, GNSS systems so far. Yeah. And then this data is again collected by uh, various data analysis centers. Yeah. And this is, uh, here, here are some of these data analysis centers. And the one that was for us, the important one was actually the one at ESOC because they were joining us in this effort and they were processing this data, this observation data to get these estimates of the clock uh, biases and of the, these effects in the clock uh, specifically for our purpose. Yeah? That means that uh, we could interact with them and they were making sure that they were using consistent models and, and so on, yeah. The alternative would have been that we uh, just access the publicly uh, available data, which you can all uh, access here on this uh, FTP server. But this is basically uh, like a black box, yeah. So here uh, you don't know what these uh, institutes really, uh, what, what are the models that they employ and everything, yeah. Um, so we could make use of this collaboration with the people at ESOC and uh, they could provide us with specifically processed uh, clock and orbit data here. Yeah. And uh, here is basically what we have done from the satellites. So during the whole uh, time span that we, we looked at, that was initially three years of, of, of measurement time. So starting from 2015 up to 2018, uh, they, there's only always one active transmitting clock. And uh, at certain times, for whatever reasons, they switch between these clocks. And this table basically shows, okay, how much data did we get from which clock and uh, how good was that data? And for example, there, was on one of the two satellites. It turns out that the hydrogen maser on that uh, satellite is not working nominally. Yeah? So we, we looked also at this data and you could really see that this data is doing very strange uh, 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 oscillations. Yeah? They did not disclose to us what the exact reason for that is, but they also told us that uh, this data is definitely compromised. Uh, or, for example, here for a certain amount of time, there was a rubidium clock running on one of the satellites. So uh, we looked also at that data, but we also saw that this data is not uh, sufficient in stability and accuracy for us. So we also had to discard that. Um, yeah, here's another way of looking at this. So you can see basically the red points is where there was no data, no active clock uh, transmitting. And then you can see that uh, basically from 2007 on, 17 on, there was always the same clock running. So since then, basically, it's always the same clock on the both satellites. And uh, we have quite continuous data now from, from, these, uh, from this amount of time. Okay, now I want to very briefly address, um, okay, the, um, uh, how does relativity now enter into the game? Yeah? Uh, and how is relativity treated in GNSS? So the time dilation for a clock moving in a weak gravitational field, you can uh, derive from the metric in a low, uh, in a weak gravitational field, simply like this, basically. And this uh, expression T would be the coordinate time, tau the proper time of your uh, clock. And then you have the gravitational redshift term here, and you have the quadratic Doppler uh, term, uh, the relativistic Doppler shift here. Uh, you also have this phi naught here, which is a small correction, or not a small correction, it's, it's, um, it's something you have to introduce if you want to establish a coordinate time, because the coordinate time here would actually be the time of a clock that is at an infinite distance away, where there's no gravitational potential. Yeah? But you have to establish your uh, practical time base um, with a clock on ground yeah, that is located on the geoid. So this is essentially the geoid potential here that comes in here. But it's a constant term and it does not uh, play a further role in, in our analysis here. And uh, yeah, of course, the two effects uh, on the orbit are of different magnitude. And if you are on a very high orbit, the, in the constant effect, the gravitational effect is the dominant one. Yeah, The special relativistic effect uh, is dominating on the low Earth orbit. But the constant effects are not the interesting ones to us here. So you can rewrite this whole integral if you want for a Kepler orbit. If you employ the, the, the Kepler formulas, 
into an expression like this. And this first expression simply describes a constant uh, time drift due to a constant frequency shift. That's the constant uh, redshift that you would have on a circular orbit, let's say. And this translates into a time drift of about 40 microseconds per day. And uh, this would, if it were not corrected for, let's say, um, translate into kilometers or error uh, in your positioning. So when there's sometimes this famous statement made that GPS doesn't work without relativity, so uh, without relativity, GPS would lead to kilometers uh, in, uh, of error in, in, in your positioning. This is where this comes from. So this comes from, yeah, from this 40 microsecond error, let's say. Uh, this, interestingly, is, however, uh, simply detuned. Uh, so there is a, um, a in, in the frequency chain, there is a 10 megahertz oscillator at some point. And the engineers actually detune this oscillator on purpose by this tiny amount to just compensate this frequency shift. Yeah? So that effectively the clock uh, up there is ticking again uh, at the same rate as, as down here. So basically if relativity, if we didn't know about relativity, probably engineers would just uh, detune this back and, and live with it. Yeah? So um, in that sense, uh, yeah, uh, the statement is maybe uh, uh, seen under, under this. Uh, yeah, but anyway, now the interesting part for us is really the modulation uh, that shows up here. This is what you have when you uh, have an eccentric orbit. So R is uh, so A is the semi-major axis, R is the actual radius, and then an eccentric orbit. Of course, this uh, leads to a modulation. You can again reformulate this uh, analytically into an exact expression like that, and very nicely you can even transform it into this very very simple expression here. Yeah? two times the velocity of the satellite times the radial position over C squared. And this simple expression describes for an ideal Kepler orbit, uh, the modulation uh, that you see in, the, in, in this uh, relativistic time uh, shift here. And this is also the model that the people in GNSS actually put into their systems to account for this effect, uh, even in the, in the, in the normal uh, GNSS satellites. And this eccentricity is usually very, very small, and the effect is very, very small. But now with these two Galileo satellites on the eccentric orbit, this really blows up because we have an eccentricity here uh, of 0.16 and not 0.001 uh, something. Yeah. And so we, we asked them uh, uh, to, to, to give us the data without subtracting this uh, eccentricity correction beforehand because usually they just uh, subtract their correction and they give you the residuals of that. So we had to specifically ask them, please don't subtract your model, give us the original data, let's say, and this is what it looks like. So you see very clearly a modulation of, in this case, a 370 nanoseconds uh, peak, and you also see this IGS model fitted. Yeah. So um, just a question, um, like, do you know whether they do it's the same thing with GPS? Um, I think they do, yeah. I, I, we also asked them, um, or it was the other way around, yeah. So, so do, you, do you mean the eccentricity correction or do you mean the detuning of the, of the oscillator to compensate for the effect uh, of the static uh, effect? Both, I mean, like uh, whether they are basically giving you, uh, I, I think the GPS data is also publicly available, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or at least on, upon request. And I'm just wondering whether you get the uh, well corrected data instead of. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, yes. So I'm without having looked at it now, of course, uh, but uh, they usually, they, they take these relativistic corrections all into account and uh, uh, subtract all their models. And then they give you basically the, the uh, the clock biases, which are the residuals of all these things, yeah. So the relativistic effects are usually all taken out then, yeah. Thank you. Exactly. Okay, yeah, if you look at the residuals now of this IGS model, of this uh, simple model, let's say, you see something like this. And of course, clearly you see a systematic modulation that is still present with the orbit. And that is of course bothering us uh, when we want to, to test this uh, relativity uh, effect here. These residuals are on the level of 500 picoseconds, and we want to uh, see an effect of 370 nanoseconds. So this is about a 10 to minus three effect here, a systematic 10 to minus three effect still here. Okay, 
Now, the first thing we uh, did, of course, is okay, maybe this model uh, has to be refined. Yeah, maybe it's not accurate enough, and there are uh, good reasons why it's not accurate enough. First of all, this is only valid for an ideal Kepler orbit. And uh, the satellites, of course, are not on a true Kepler orbit. Yeah? They are disturbed by non-gravitational forces, most importantly by solar radiation pressure. And um, if you have a disturbed orbit, yeah, you should actually, to make a more accurate calculation, not use this analytic uh, expression for the Kepler orbit, but you should solve this uh, integral numerically along the path that is given to you uh, from the orbit products yeah, that give you uh, the actual uh, path. And that will lead to some deviations. And these deviations are shown here. So we, 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 we went one step back. We numerically integrated this uh, data. And we looked at the difference to this IGS model. And you can see clearly there is a systematic difference uh, here at twice the orbit frequency and on the level of 50 picoseconds. Yeah. Or 50, 70 picoseconds. And this is a significant effect, of course, that has to be taken into account. A further effect that is normally not taken into account is that you can also not just include the Earth's mass monopole, yeah, that was uh, in, in, in this thing, but you can also account for the fact that Earth is actually flattened to a rotational ellipsoid. So you can take into account the quadrupole uh, moment for the redshift as well, not just for the orbit, but for the redshift. And this we also took into account, this is this J2 term, yeah. And both combined give you this black signal that we had to put into the data as an additional correction. And we could see that this works basically because if we don't correct for this, uh, we see this, uh, and we do here a Fourier transform of data of one week, we see a systematic uh, residual effect here at twice the orbital frequency. And uh, if we apply our correction, we can make this vanish. So this shows us that we can really improve the data here. Uh, there's also, uh, of course, well, not of course, but there's also the effect of other gravitational uh, um, bodies of sun and moon, which will lead to uh, tidal potentials. Yeah, and I will come back to that uh, later, maybe. But this also gives you a small frequency shift and a small shift in your timing signal here, uh, something below 10 picoseconds. Yeah. And uh, we did assess this uh, very early on. And at that time, we concluded, OK, 10 picoseconds is not the level that we uh, will attain, probably. And so I looked at it and uh, basically to put it aside yeah, in the beginning, uh, unfortunately, as we will see in, a, in the end. So I try to be a bit more brief uh, because time has already advanced. And I want to come to uh, some other things all as well. So very, very basically. Uh, so what we did then is we applied a least squares fit to this data of our refined model. The refined model includes the quadrupole moment um, here, and it includes the numerically integrated effect. And uh, we fit this to these uh, clock residuals that we get uh, from from the from the from these uh, from the data analysis center from ESOC. Yeah. Uh, we put in a drift and offset term as additional fit parameters. And then the decisive fit parameter here is our test parameter alpha. Now you may notice that the way I have written it here, this test parameter does not only uh, apply here to the gravitational redshift, but it also applies to the quadratic Doppler effect here. And uh, we did this initially because uh, this was, let's say, along the lines that the gravity probe A uh, measurement had been analyzed. They also looked at, let's say, the, uh, the accuracy on the combined effect of the relativistic effects here. This leads to some confusion because uh, this is not exactly the, the definition of this alpha parameter that only applies to the gravitational redshift that I have shown before. And uh, I will also come back to that maybe. Yeah. But so our test parameter that I'm stating uh, later is for the combined effect here. Yeah. OK, so the fit results, we did this now. The, the data, by the way, comes in daily segments. So they always process 24-hour arcs of the data. So we fitted every day separately and uh, extracted an alpha value of every day um, for the three clocks that provided more or less good data yeah, on these two satellites. And you can see 
two of these clocks still show some, uh, uh, yeah, let's say, weird behavior or strange systematics. And there was one clock that I would say was reasonably uh, uh, stable. Yeah. There is a certain, uh, well, glitch here in the data and we tried hard to figure out what had happened there. We asked the people from operations if during this time they did some uh, switching of the onboard instruments and stuff like that, but uh, we couldn't really identify so far what was the reason for this. Yeah, So uh, we left it in the data for now. Um, what of course also uh, is evident uh, quite clearly here is that if you now average this data, if you do statistics with this data, uh, there is still a positive overall bias, yeah. So you, you, we got basically this from this data, yeah. And of course, there must be reasons for that. And we started to look into the systematic uh, possible bias that is there, yeah. And uh, ideas, uh, what could be the systematic bias for that is, uh, of course, as I mentioned initially, temperature has an effect on the clocks, magnetic fields have an effect on the clocks. Uh, we might even think about uh, ground clocks that uh, these clocks are compared to and that are also in this system of estimating these uh, clock biases. But there, luckily, uh, there's no good reason why these ground clocks should show a systematic that is in sync with the orbit timescale. So luckily, we are looking at systematics that only occur re really at the orbital uh, frequency. So we can disentangle it from other frequencies uh, quite nicely. It turns out the most important uh, systematics, however, are more indirect uh, uh, systematics. And they come from the fact that you are actually um, determining um, these uh, clock products from this combined estimation of orbits and clock data. Yeah? And that means if you have a systematic error in your orbit that you put into this pseudo range equation, that translates into an error of the clock so if you have a centimeter error systematically in your orbit, that will turn into a systematic uh, error uh, of, uh, 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 in, of your clock here. Yeah. And um, so what could cause such an effect? So this is one of the very early uh, plots we did when we were given some data. Uh, up here, you see uh, the orbit going up and down. Um, uh, between perigee and apogee. And down here, you see the clock residuals. And you see there's the systematic oscillation. And if you now look 23 weeks earlier, you see that the systematic oscillation is actually shifted. So that means that there is uh, not an effect that is in phase exactly with the orbit, but is shifting phase over the time scale of a year. And the reason for that, um, we concluded, or it's, uh, is that this must be something related to the sun, yeah? because if you have a systematic effect that comes from the sun, the sun position relative to the orbit changes by 360 degrees in phase uh, during one year. So this was an indication that you can have an effect here from, uh, from, uh, from, from a solar effect. Yeah? And uh, the reason was not very surprising, let's say. Uh, solar radiation pressure, I already indicated, is a major uh, uh, effect on the satellites. Yeah? Uh, sorry, solar what, radiation. Are, what are we looking at? What is this? Ah, this I'm sorry, I, I put this in uh, because I found it uh, a nice demonstration of radiation pressure in general. Yeah. Uh, is it in there? Sorry, no, 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 no. Uh, this is this has nothing to do with uh, solar radiation pressure. I just wanted to say, um, solar radiation pressure can uh, can give you um, micronewton forces on your satellite, and these forces can displace your Galileo satellite by by many meters, yeah, over the course of one orbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah but what you are showing typically, if it's, I think it's in, in the lab, right? So exactly, this, what I'm showing here is- have nothing to do, actually, uh, this is very confusing. I think yeah, they sorry. have nothing to do with light pressure. Yeah, <laughs> so, sorry, what I'm showing down here is just uh, uh, some nice video that I found uh, that is uh, demonstrating how they want to use uh, radiation pressure, yeah, laser radiation pressure on a, on a CubeSat to push no, the sorry, CubeSat I think around. it's not radiation pressure. Your, your laser beam is, is uh, heating that surface, and so it's, it's uh, the, the molecules of the air, uh, when they come out, they are hot, so it's a little jet engine. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's a fake uh, uh, in, in air. Ah. There are effects like this, but it's it's not it has nothing to do with it. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Then I then I take this back. Yeah, then I will remove this from <laughs> from the, the talk. I, I I more or less thought it it it, it was an, uh, a demonstration of, uh, of of some high power laser with. Okay, okay. If no, it's really can, just we the, can assume it. We can assume it's in vacuum. <laughs> I have to check. I have to check. It's some uh, it's some laser propulsion that they that they suggested and demonstrated. They say I think they. So I, I will check back. Yeah, this is actually taken just uh, from Bay Corporation or something. They uh, they showed this as a demonstration of laser propulsion. Uh, so they ha they have a resonator. I'm just thinking they, they have a, 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 okay. a 500 milliwatt laser and they amplify it. I think in a in a. So this is a resonant scheme here. They amplify it by a factor of. Uh, Hundred thousand or thousand or so. Well, one, one needs to look at the at the parameters, but I think most of the of, yeah. of the demonstration like this are, are actually this um, red, uh, uh, rocket effect, basically, right? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. That's uh, I will check. I will check. Thank you. Yeah, I think there has to be air, otherwise you wouldn't have so much scattering there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. You wouldn't see this this beam probably there. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Anyway, the solar radiation pressure very different yeah uh, puts micronewton forces on the galileo satellites and displaces the the orbit yeah and uh, and the solar radiation pressure is of course also modulated over a yearly time scale yeah so i'm indicating here in particular this uh, beta angle which is the elevation of the sun over the orbital plane and this orbital elevation angle that is modulated over the course of one year so you have different uh, um um, uh, um, um, yeah, impinge, differently impinging uh, solar radiation on your satellite and uh, have a modulated effect there. Yeah. Now, this is taken into account when they process the orbit data in the GNSS. They have certain models for this effect, but the models are not perfect. Yeah, and they have systematic errors. These models. Now, luckily, there is a way to check these GNSS orbit models. Uh, independently, and this is done by comparing these orbit models from GNSS with laser ranging data. So the Galileo satellites are equipped with uh, retro reflector arrays, so you can do laser ranging to these, and you can, at a couple of centimeters, uh, determine Nicht for certain points the the uh, the, uh, uh, the position of these satellites. Yeah, not continuously, just here and there, but you can uh, do that, and you can. Uh, make a comparison to your orbit uh, product. Yeah. And again, there is a international laser ranging service, which uh, has many stations worldwide where you can uh, do these ranging measurements. And this is shown on this map here. And it's already been, been known uh, before yeah, that with these laser ranging uh, uh, data, you can form the residuals between your GNSS orbit product and the laser ranging data. And from these residuals, you can see that there is something systematic going on. Yeah. You can see that here are the laser ranging residuals for the two uh, for the for two of the previous satellites uh, with an older uh, solar radiation pressure model here by Montenbruck et al. Uh, from 2013. And here, this red line is the beta uh, angle, this inclination angle of the sun over the orbital plane, which is modulated over the course of one year. And you can see that depending on this beta angle, these residuals uh, change in characteristic. And this has always already been taken as an indication that there is something wrong with the modeling of the solar radiation pressure and that this uh, can be improved. And this um, uh, is something that we targeted. So there was a, a, a dedicated effort there uh, that went out a message to the uh, International Laser Aging Service that they increase the priority of our measurements of these Galileo satellites that we can collect as many laser ranging data from these satellites as possible. And with this laser ranging data, the people from ESOC then could systematically improve their solar radiation pressure model that they put in. So they did three iterations with subsequently improved radiation pressure models that could, let's say, minimize the systematic variations of these residuals. Yeah? And they improved this to something like uh, uh, the systematic uh, uh, offset here between these two uh, orbits are around zero and the RMS deviation of uh, on the order of two centimeters here, which is a significant improvement already yeah, to that before. And at the same time, reducing this orbital systematics improved the clock systematics. Yeah? So we did not play around with the solar radiation pressure measure to reduce the systematics in the clock because that way we would make anything vanish. Yeah? 
but it was only used to improve the orbit systematics. And here you can see uh, the green ones were the initial clock residuals plotted here for two weeks, modulo 360 degrees. And you can see a clear systematic in the clock uh, bias here. And this was improved by subsequently um, uh, applying better solar radiation pressure models here. And this reduced the systematics in the measurement uh, significantly. OK, um, I will very briefly say a few words. It's already past me, sorry. Um, uh, temperature. So the situation is uh, uh, that uh, the clocks are actively temperature stabilized to about uh, 0.5 Kelvin here. And we know roughly the uh, temperature sensitivity. Um, we asked several times uh, to obtain some uh, data from uh, the temperature sensors on board, uh, but it was not possible for us to convince them to, to give them to us. So we had to fall back to uh, using this information that we have plus uh, the idea that the temperature is actually driven by solar illumination. So this also can be disentangled over the course of one year uh, since there is a systematic shift here. And then we uh, did some various modeling so of various, let's say worst case scenario. What, what, what is the worst that can happen? And that led us to an uncertainty estimate on the order of two times 10 to the minus five uh, on our alpha parameter. Magnetic fields, the situation is uh, even a bit worse because there are no magnetometers on board of the satellites. Uh, we know the sensitivity of the clocks. And uh, the only thing we could do there is actually really to uh, adopt uh, the IGRF model of Earth's magnetic field. Yeah. Uh, to model what is the expected magnetic field there, uh, how does that map into the clock axis? So here you can see if you either take the total field modulation or the, uh, the modulation along the sensitive clock axis, which we take to be the cylinder axis of these uh, hydrogen masers. And uh, we try to improve our confidence in this IGRF model a bit. Uh, we talked to people from Braunschweig who, who gave us some uh, uh, look into the uh, mission, uh, in the data from the Themis mission which collected magnetic field data on various altitudes. And we looked at the data from there at the altitude of the Galileo satellites and how large the residuals of this data with the uh, IGRF model was. And uh, that was at, uh, I think, a few percent level. And that was OK for us to give a very coarse estimate of the uncertainty that comes from this. And we and ended up here with uh, a level of 8 times 10 to minus 6 in alpha. Sorry, can I ask you something Sorry. about this? I thought that uh, on board of um, uh, of spacecraft, uh, indeed, the the the, the field uh, uh, the the main field is is from some from various uh, on board sources. For instance, thermal currents uh, and so on. So that's yes. much bigger. That's yes, yes, that that is true. Yeah, or, or that may be true. Yeah, um, for. All that we know and assessed so far, there, this fields uh, should not be modulated uh, with the orbital period. Yeah. So yes, yes, uh, that's right. May, maybe indirectly. I mean, it's, it's ah, true. Maybe, maybe, in, maybe though, because if if it's uh, if it's thermal uh, current or current due to to the sun photo effect, then uh, then uh, depending on whether they are illuminated uh, and the intensity of the sun illumination, that can can also change. That's that's true. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Unfortunately, we had no really no means to 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 access that in some way. But it's absolutely true. Yeah? Um, let's say we did not, or as you will see in the in the final result, there was a systematic bias, and uh, this little small systematic bias can still be uh, due to these effects. Yeah, that's that's maybe true. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we, we looked at uh, some other things. Uh, I already said uh, the ground clocks uh, may be something. Uh, there are specific effects uh, called something called phase wind up. Uh, atmospheric effects, uh, there we uh, are pretty confident that uh, they also should average, yeah, and they should not map into something that is at the orbital frequency. And in the end, uh, yeah, we. We did uh, a budget uh, that is uh, basically shown here, and that led us to this value, which we uh, published here on this alpha parameter here. Now, since then, we have uh, uh, more data. But unfortunately, since the 
the sensitivity is really limited by the systematics, averaging over more data does not really help us to improve the result. Yeah. So I'm just showing this that uh, the satellites are still continuing to uh, collect data and the data looks more or less uh, undisturbed uh, as, as the one before. Yeah. One thing that I have to uh, point out though is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I did an estimate of these uh, uh, tidal potential effects of sun and moon very early on. And I, at that point said, okay, these one to 10 picoseconds will probably not uh, bother us. And I put it aside and very uh, unfortunately, I did not uh, come back to this uh, in the end, only after uh, uh, we had uh, published it. And uh, turns out if you really include this, effect into your uh, model and refine the model by this, this really contributes uh, by eight times 10 to the minus six. And it also, if you take it into account, reduces this uh, bias that we had of 2.2 initially to 1.4. So including really this uh, sun and moon tidal potentials uh, finally reduces the, uh, the this initial bias that we had of one sigma below one sigma. Yeah. I should also uh, highlight that our definition of alpha is different from the definition that uh, uh, Pakom Delva in his paper uh, used. So when we go back to this original definition of uh, the, the alpha parameter only uh, taking into account the, uh, the gravitational uh, redshift and not the quadratic Doppler effect, that essentially doubles uh, our estimates here. Yeah? So to do a fair comparison of the two results, you have to double this and then you can compare the two results. And in that sense, you can see that a Pacom Delva's result is more stringent here yeah, than, than our result. Yeah. I can explain about that maybe uh, later a bit more yeah, where, where this comes from. Okay, uh, I will be quick on, on the last uh, few slides. Sorry that I'm uh, probably already taking a bit too much time. Uh, there is much more work going on uh, towards uh, testing uh, uh, the, the redshift. Uh, maybe you have heard of the Radio Astron uh, mission. It's a Russian uh, radio telescope in space uh, that is uh, on an extremely eccentric orbit that is almost going up to the moon here. And a radio telescope to do a very long baseline uh, uh, interferometry measurements here with radio telescopes, you need a hydrogen maser as a time reference. So this has a hydrogen maser, an active hydrogen maser, or had an active hydrogen, hydrogen maser on board. Unfortunately, also in this mission, they came up with the idea to use this as a test of uh, the redshift only after the mission was already uh, designed and everything. So they're working to get uh, uh, on, uh, on, on getting an estimate at the level of uh, a few times in, in 10 to the minus five here. Yeah but uh, they have to do some workarounds because they also don't have a two-way uh, frequency link and they have to live with this uh, Doppler effect there. Uh, you may know about the planned ACES mission, which should put a cold atom cesium clock on the ISS. And here the idea is to use this also in a very precise test of the gravitational redshift, uh, going an order of magnitude lower, yeah. Here you don't have this modulation, here you will really have to use an accurate comparison between the clock up there and the clock down uh, on the ground uh, and, uh, and, and make use of the absolute accuracy of your clock. Uh, there have been these uh, mission proposals that I mentioned earlier that we have also participated in like SDE Quest, where the idea is that you could uh, uh, maybe improve this down to the level of 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight by using really state of the art clocks and going onto a very eccentric orbit. But, it's very hard to get such missions funded, yeah? to get someone spent hundreds of millions of uh, euros or dollars on a fundamental physics mission that will, in the end, just find out that everything is okay uh, just by two orders of magnitude better. Yeah? It's, it's, it's very hard to get that funded. And that's why I think this uh, case with the Galileo satellites is maybe pointing to a, a way to, to get these things uh, also in different ways. Is a CubeSat uh, a cheaper way to go on this? Uh, if one would be able to is uh, to to get everything that is needed on a cube set, but I I don't see that at the moment. I have to say, yeah, uh, I think it's um, I don't think cube sets are an option for the for the next ten years uh, for the, this kind of mission, unfortunately. But uh, maybe one could could think about it. Yeah, um, I wanted to highlight uh, this very nice work that you have probably maybe also seen by uh, Hidetoshi Katori, uh, who did 
an actual lab test, let's say, of the redshift uh, in Tokyo, where he put two strontium lattice clocks, uh, very, very accurate and stable uh, clocks at the 10 to minus 18 level. Uh, here you can see these two clocks uh, at the bottom and at the top of the Tokyo Sky Tower. Yeah? And the height difference of 400 and uh, something meters. And he, due to the excellent frequency stability of his clocks, and accuracy of his clocks, he was able to establish uh, a measurement of the redshift at the level of uh, just below 10 to the minus uh, four, so nine times 10 to the minus five, which is very impressive, I think. And of course, one has to highlight here, everything is much better under control yeah, and much better uh, uh, to be studied systematically than on the satellites that were never done uh, for this purpose. Um, you know probably also maybe about these uh, efforts or, or about these uh, possibilities that you can now do comparisons of very accurate clocks at this 10 to the minus 18 level uh, by uh, optical fibers yeah at extremely good precisions yeah for example there is a, a, a comparison has been done between strontium lattice clocks at ptb in braunschweig and in hanover and um, you could also see here the gravitational redshift between these two clocks because they are different heights yeah? And there's a lot of interest uh, in these uh, measurements, uh, particularly from the geodesy uh, community, because you could actually make practical use of the gravitational redshift in geodesy by using clocks, clocks at the 10 to minus 18 uh, level, yeah, because then you are sensitive to redshift effects really at the centimeter level, yeah, and this would give people in geodesy if you would manage to have portable clocks. Uh, at this level, and that you can compare to uh, maybe, uh, let's say, some reference clock somewhere via optical fibers or by other means. This would give you a direct access to measuring uh, the, the so called geoid. Yeah? The geoid is the gravitational equipotential service that is closest to uh, the sea level. Yeah? And this is uh, something, of course, uh, that serves as an important hate reference yeah, in geodesy. And so far, you can only get there indirectly, let's say, by using gravimetry or gradiometry, which always measures the derivative of this equipotential service, uh, uh, surface. Sorry. Now, using clocks gives you direct access to the potential, yeah? And this is uh, of huge interest uh, there. And interestingly, if you would use this method uh, with these clocks to measure, let's say, a one kilometer height difference yeah, between a mountain and, and, and the valley here, at a centimeter uh, resolution, that means you have to employ the redshift at a level of 10 to the minus five uh, accuracy. That means to do that, uh, testing the redshift is really an important critical or an, an important aspect, yeah? uh, that you are sure that relativity is valid also on this level, because for such a practical measurement, you would already get to the boundary of where relativity has been tested so far. So I think this is a nice uh, also motivation to improve these tests. Uh, yeah, I have one or two uh, few comments uh, here. Uh, then finally, on some uh, aspects that uh, uh, has also gained some attention. That is, could you do gravitational redshift tests also with uh, quantum devices? Yeah, and uh, there have been some proposals and papers out there. I'm just showing two or three here. Uh, you know maybe about the proposal here by Magdalena Zuch and Chaslav Okna um, to use actually here the gravitational shift in the time to use the time as a label on these uh, interferometer paths to have which way information yeah and that then they suggest that th this would lead to a dephasing in your interferometer at some point yeah um, that you would have a decrease in the visibility of your interferometer and this is uh, what enters into this uh, uh, visibility here and uh, colleagues here from Hanover who are setting up a large uh, facility to do atom interferometry on large scales here uh, over a height distance of 10 meters roughly. They are looking into this also and have thought about this and have shown that you could do such an experiment, for example, if you were uh, to use the um, terabium here and if you were to use a superposition between here uh, electronic states uh, here, uh, an optical transition. Then with these parameters of a height difference of the superposition of 10 meters, uh, one second evolution time and an optical transition, you could actually really see this dephasing due to gravity in the quantum system uh, after one second. So we'll see 
uh, if that will be implemented at some point. Uh, there's this paper by Albert Rohrer who uh, formulated how a test of gravitational redshift could be done, for example, in a geometry like this, uh, ramsey bordy type interferometry with four pi over two pulses. And uh, yeah, um, there's another proposal by uh, 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 Christian Ufrecht here who uh, uh, suggested that, uh, oh, sorry, maybe I should just say very briefly, uh, the idea here is really to interfere clock states yeah, that you uh, create uh, at this stage, um, a superposition of internal states, yeah, really a clock, and then you do the interference with, with clocks, yeah, not have the atoms in uh, energy eigenstates, but do interferometry with clock states, yeah, yeah. And here, Christian Ulfrecht now here has a paper where he claims that uh, you could do this actually also in energy eigenstates here, but you have to alternate uh, this internal state here subsequently to get your sensitivity to the redshift. and. I think uh, he gives an estimate of this configuration here that says, okay, something in the range of 10 to the minus three uh, could be feasible with some optimistic assumption of uh, technological progress on these uh, beam splitters here. And also again, doing this with optical transitions in strontium or thermium. So I'm sorry if I have been very quick on the last points, but I'm way over time, sorry about that. So I'm summarizing here. Uh, we evaluated this data from these two satellites, uh, given all the boundary conditions that I have uh, shown you, yeah, uh, that, um, uh, and concluded that we can say that there's a, something like a fourfold reduced uncertainty in the redshift test and the accuracy is limited by the systematics. Uh, we could reduce one of the most important systematics, uh, which is due to the orbit and due to the solar radiation pressure. And in general, I think what I see this effort in as uh, that it it shows us a little bit what uh, that we can look in other places also to really do these fundamental physics missions, yeah. Because having dedicated missions will be really really hard in the future. Yeah. The other way around, I could also say that even the GNSS people also learned a little bit about this. So, so they used the way of looking at the clock data and doing the conclusions for the orbit data also to improve their orbit solutions, yeah. These orbit solutions that I have shown at two centimeter uh, RMS deviation are actually now the best orbit uh, products that they have. Yeah. And yeah, and I talked a little bit about these uh, gravitational redshift in delocalized clocks. So I'm sorry this took a bit too long. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I thank you for holding on and for your uh, attention, thank you. Wow, oh, thanks a lot for this great talk. Uh, I am not at all concerned that you, I mean. No, I, I am a bit that because was, it was way too long, but anyway. <laughs> we, we interrupted. I'm, I'm sure there, yeah, yeah, Dima especially interrupted. Yeah. No, no, no anecdote. problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's why it took so long. Otherwise, it would have been perfect in time. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I think there are probably a couple of questions, and because, um, yeah, because I'm currently hosting, I would like to ask my first one before Dima takes it away uh, from me. Um, can you go back to the residual slides? And it's maybe a bit disappointing to you. No problem, um, yeah. Uh, which side? Residuals? Uh, the, the, uh, like 53 or something like this. You uh, mean the, the budget here or the... the... No, 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 the test of the gravitational redshift, the data, actually, looking at the data. I think it's around slide uh, 53, where you show the new data from uh, E14 and so on. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, no, yeah, 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 I remember, yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure whether you know, but uh, we are looking for uh, topological dark matter in uh, in like a magnetometer. In GNSS data. also, or? No, but in uh, we, we are doing it in the global network of optical magnetometers. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking for dark matter topological dark matter in the universe that collides with Earth and causes some mm -hmm. sort of signature that looks like the peaks that you have there. So ah, I'm, okay. just wondering, <laughs> I'm just Maybe. wondering whether we collided with something there that we are not aware. There's also, uh, by the way, uh, something called gps.dm is uh, colleagues from us. They are looking for uh, topological dark matter in the signatures of uh, the GPS. Exactly, time, yes. That, that, right? that, I, that I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question is now, uh, is it complicated for you to check in other satellites whether that is like an event that also other satellites saw? 
Yes, um, we, we, we asked exactly this question to uh, the people from ISOC who hand us all the data and uh, we also have to just ask uh, if they can do that for us and they looked uh, into uh, various data and it is indeed uh, I think a similar feature in one, at least one, but not in all uh, the satellites, I think that was what they told us then. They, I don't, I cannot say how many satellite data they checked. We asked them to check at least, I think, E11, which is on a, a, a normal satellite uh, on a regular uh, thing. Uh, one question is maybe these topological things when you pass through a boundary of these uh, dark matter uh, sections, I don't know how, how long would that extend? Because this this peak here is actually something that extends over seven days, so roughly. Yeah. So I'm not so sure must how. Be, must be uh, like I mean I don't know. That's also the problem that I uh, immediately saw. But um, like be, be, because we are looking for something that is much faster, as it takes a second mm -hmm. or something like this when it passes through Earth. But you can uh, here what you can envision is something of the size of uh, I don't know how far we travel. Uh, in that time, so maybe uh, yeah, a couple of uh, million kilometers in diameter that uh, yeah, we are traveling in that time. So it has I mean, to be that big, right? As a and that it would probably would be some sort of dark matter star that we collided yeah, with. Yeah. Yeah, what I have to point out, though, also is that uh, what we see here is the the fit results of this test parameter, and they are always connected to let's say the Fourier component of the orbital frequency. So what this peak means that, uh, say, saying it quite plainly is that the frequency has oscillated somehow a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, so there, there is, let's say an orbital period that somehow uh, increased and then vanished again, yeah, somehow. And we, we asked them about uh, whatever data they could look in for this time window, let's say, and they, they looked uh, if the, what happened on the satellites, but we they showed us some other events that were earlier or before when they switched on the gyro or when they uh, did some other things on, on uh, in, in operations. But we could not find anything that really coincides with, with this one, yeah. But, but could we, I mean, like, is it, uh, could we just maybe as like a, is it, com could, could you just look at the other data from the satellites? Could you request it, look at the data at that time and see whether there's a similar peak? Because uh, then we could, we call it the Hermann collision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, we, we, we asked them, um, I can go back to these emails, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a, a quite, uh, a, quite a while ago, but I can go, uh, look back into the conversation we had then. Yeah, It was going back and forth a, a bit uh, and they showed that a similar effect was in some of the satellites, but then again, it's it's quite complicated, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's uh, let me see. It's it's interesting that it was also there in all the reprocessings. I said they did two three reprocessings of the data with improved models and so on, and this peak was always there. So that all more or less indicates a little bit. Okay, it's not an artifact of some model that they had, uh, but it's something something real. Yeah? Cool, thanks. Anyway, um, uh, don't want to hijack the whole question. I, 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 will, I will come back to them, uh, to that, and ask them. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's usually not so easy always to, to get them, <laughs> hand out some some specific uh, uh, data and insights. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Thanks a lot. Anyway, uh, so are there more questions, maybe? Dima has one. Very good. Go ahead, Dima. I actually have a comment, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, of course. Which is a, a very, very interesting for me, um, because um, um, as you were uh, describing this experiment, I realized that a few years back, uh, we've done something uh, that is kind of similar, uh, only in, 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 instead of the uh, satellites on uh, elliptical orbits, we used um, uh, Earth as a spaceship uh, going around the sun. It also has an eccentricity of about 2%, and um, the gravitational uh, the, the dimensionless gravitational potential that you wrote delta u over c squared uh, is I think uh, it's 10 to minus 7 or so and uh, or 10 to minus 8 and it's changing by uh, about a couple of percent so you have 10 to minus 10 change in this uh, dimensional gravitational potential and what we were looking at is variation of alpha 
uh, we, not your alpha, but the fine structure yes, constant. Fine structure constant. This, is mm -hmm. one, uh, this is one of the ways how this dependence in your redshift could come because, because it's, uh, it's measured by a clock. And so if the, if the properties of the clock are changing. Uh, so we had a, uh, an atomic clock, uh, uh, which is a, a little bit unusual. It was dysprosium atoms. Uh, it was different transitions in dysprosium atoms, self-reference. So, so, so basically the, all the uh, uh, GR stuff is common, but the variation of alpha is different. So it was very specifically um, uh -huh. designed for that. And, uh, and we set limits at 10 to minus six level. Uh, so, so, so you say delta alpha uh, is on the order of um, uh, 10 to minus less than 10 to minus six times the 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 variation of gravitational potential. So so sort of kind of similar level of um, okay, cool, depth. very interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, here's uh, the reference if you like. Okay, oh, thank you, Em. Yeah. I will. I have to copy that. Yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah, and the first thing I posted there is this uh, toy uh, radiometer toy. You 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 know it's a it's a glass bulb and you shine light on it and it ah, spins. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it's the same effect uh, that, <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of, hmm. yeah. But maybe maybe the parameters in what you showed are such that it's really the light pressure because, uh, okay, we know that in, in cold atoms or something, right? The, 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 you can have 10 to the whatever, five Gs or something like this, right? Acceleration, so it's possible in principle, right? Yes, yes. Oh. Just give me one second. My low, but I have plugged it in. I have to check one minute just that I'm not disappearing. No. Strange. Sorry, it should be loading, but uh, let's see. <laughs> What's loading? Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, uh, I have plugged in my computer. On, on, on net power here, but uh, my screen just said that my uh, battery is low. Uh, I, I don't understand it, but we will see. Maybe I will be cut off, but uh, I hope not. Ah, okay. Well, I mean, we are also uh, nearly at the end. Maybe uh, there are other questions. I would advertise the next quantum seminar to you, but uh, the speaker is not getting back to us, so it's currently oh, okay. a bit exciting. Um, whether he will speak, it's uh, he. I, I forgot. It's uh, it's a Japanese person doing diamond superconductivity. Oh, okay, Karavada, cool. okay. Kavarada, okay. Uh, something like this. I, I I forgot the name, but I wrote him an email today asking. Uh, are there more questions to Sven Hermann? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. So maybe we, uh, I, I briefly considered on uh, going on a rant about uh, quantum and not quantum uh, regarding your, uh, the last proposed gravitational measurements, but I think it's not worth it, you know. <laughs> I, I have no, it's a, I don't have any stakes in it. Yeah, I know it's a, it's, I think it's an interesting uh, question, but I think a lot of things have to be clarified and better understood. And it's uh, the theoreticians that I talk to say that it's very not not easy to to be also let's say correct and concise in all the formulations and everything. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's so. just like we are we are in the process of submitting grants to the BMBF, which wants to really fund. Uh, quantum 2.0 and I, I remember that at least I, I mean for example all those clocks are definitely quantum 2.0 devices but uh, then I mean it's just single I mean like the things that you show the st uh, strontium clocks or single iron atom iron clocks are just like single atoms that are interrogated somehow and um, not sure how that is quantum 2.0 but it, Again, this is completely absolutely, wrong. absolutely. Um, also, in the atom interferometers, you usually look at the at the uh, at the trajectory of a point particle, basically, and everything. Yeah, and it's uh, you call it the quantum test is, yeah, uh, difficult. Yeah, <laughs> so a strong similar thing with Holger Müller's uh, experiment uh, where he has the cesium atoms in the cavity, and uh, does everything in the cavity is like. I don't know, probably has like 2 million atoms in his cavity modes, but it's like 2 million individual experiments. 
that there's no interaction between any of the atoms uh, happening. Um, yeah, yeah right. which is it's still a great experiment and everything. Yeah, it's... And it wouldn't fall into the quantum 2.0 category. Quantum in, uh, 2.0 is indeed maybe something is, requires more, yeah. I, I agree, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I don't see any other questions. So, I think Dima uh, has, has raised oh, the yeah, hand. Dima, sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, super interesting for me. So I'm sorry for keeping. Um, I just, uh, uh, maybe another comment is that I think uh, uh, there is a lot of common uh, interest um, between us. Uh, and in particular, we have uh, uh, also a proposal here um, to, to do um, some GR tests um, with satellites with a with sort of a new type of sensor. Um, so uh, maybe uh, maybe okay. Yeah, so. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I let me just check if I can actually. So I, I stop my sharing here, and I, I I have to make sure that I can really copy these things because the last time. Yeah, they I, disappear. I know with uh, uh, with uh, Zoom they disappear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They disappear. Yeah. So otherwise, I have to uh, write you an email and ask you about it again. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, okay. Now I now I have it. I think cool. Yeah, Dima, I didn't want mean to cut you short. I thought your hand was still raised from uh, before, which I I I I I lowered it and I raised it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, but uh, maybe we close the quantum seminar now. So uh, with the last uh, twelve people or what? Um, thanks a lot, Sven yeah, Hermann, for the really interesting talk and uh, yeah, see yeah, you thanks all for holding next week. out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And yeah, thanks. Thank you. And bye -bye. Uh, have, a, have a nice week. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>